put into Google on my computer the final words of great people. And up came this website that spelled out some of the final words of great people in our time. For example, it said that John Wayne, the famous actor from last century, when he died at the age of 72, he turned to his wife and said, of course I know who you are. You're my girl, I love you. John Wayne's final words revealed the love that he had for his wife. Or according to Steve Jobs' sister Mona, the Apple's founder's final last words were, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. It seems that for Steve Jobs, he couldn't believe that he was dying. You see, final words, the words spoken before one dies, often reveals what is in a person's heart. I wonder, what will your final words be when you face your final moment? What will your final words be when you face that moment that we all have to face one day? Well, this morning on Good Friday, I want to reflect on the final words of Jesus, his final words that he muttered as he hung on the cross. These are traditionally called the seven sayings of Jesus or the seven cries of Jesus from the cross because as Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out these seven things and they reveal his heart and his message. But just to set the scene for you today so we can be gripped by the gravity of these final cries of Jesus. I want to review the past 24 hours of Jesus' life. You see, on Thursday night, after celebrating Passover with Jesus' disciples, he spent time with them in the Garden of Gethsemane from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. As he contemplated what laid ahead of him on the cross, he sweat drops of blood and he said, my soul is sorrowful even to the point of death. Then at 12 O'clock, midnight, Judas came with temple guards and Jesus was arrested. Then about 1 a.m., he went before Caiaphas, the high priest, and the council of the Sanhedrin, where he was falsely accused, where he was mocked, where he was spat on and struck. And then at about 5 a.m., he went before the whole Sanhedrin, all of the Jewish elders, and they falsely accused him of blasphemy. And then they handed him over to Pilate, around 6 a.m. You see, they didn't have the authority to put him to death, so they needed the Romans to do it. But when he appeared before Pilate, the Roman governor, Pilate saw through their accusations and could not find anything wrong with him, so Pilate sent him on to Herod. Herod didn't want to deal with him, so he sent him back to Pilate. And then at about 8 a.m. in the morning, once again, Pilate couldn't find anything wrong with Jesus. And as a politician, Pilate wanted to appease the crowd, and so he gave them a choice. At Passover, it was Pilate's custom to release one of the prisoners for the crowd, so he gave them a choice. He said, you can either have Jesus or Barabbas. Which one do you choose? Barabbas was a known criminal. Well, the people cried out, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. When Pilate said to them, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? They said, crucify him, crucify him. So at about 8 a.m. in the morning, Pilate washed his hands and delivered Jesus over to be crucified. Now, Jesus was then taken by the Roman guards into their headquarters, and in front of about 600 soldiers, he was stripped down naked. The soldiers then put a scarlet robe on him. They they twisted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. And then they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They struck him and then they beat him. And after this, they gave him the 39 lashes minus one. 40 lashes would kill a person. 39 was just to the point almost of death. And so Jesus was beaten and bloodied to a pulp. But then they put his clothes back on him and they led him away to be crucified. They put a cross, they put the cross on his shoulders and expected him to carry it. On his way to crucifixion, Jesus' physical strength gave out in numerous times and he fell over and finally he couldn't go any further and so they forced Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross instead. And upon reaching Golgotha, there they crucified him. They put nails in his feet and nails in his hands, putting him to a Roman cross and hoisted him up 
Crucifixion was a cruel way to die. You die by suffocation because you have to pull yourself up to take a breath. And there Jesus hung between two thieves. Above Jesus they wrote, here is Jesus, King of the Jews. And the soldiers divided his garments. And those who passed him by, they mocked him saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down and save yourself. And then the chief priests and the elders and the scribes mocked him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. And it was right at this moment, as the soldiers were dividing his clothes, as the people were mocking him, saying he saved others, he cannot save himself, right at this moment, Jesus let out his first cry. In Luke 23, in verse 34, we read this. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Notice right at the very beginning, Jesus calls God still Father. He's still in fellowship with God the Father. That will soon change as time goes on and the full fury of God is pulled out on Jesus. But there he hangs while the crowds are mocking and being crucified and while his enemies are dividing his garments and Jesus intercedes for them, asking God to forgive them. I mean, Jesus, at this moment, he could have called 12 legions of angels who would have been ready and eager to come to the defense of the king of kings and annihilate his enemies. With one word, it could have been over. But his first thought was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus had taught his disciples to forgive those who persecute you and to pray for them, and Jesus was doing this exact thing. You know, I sometimes meet people who say, you don't know what I've done, Timon. I've been so bad that I don't think God would ever forgive me. I, I couldn't come into church because if I came into church, I would be struck down. Well, these first final words of Jesus, this first cry of Jesus should assure us that if Jesus was willing to forgive his enemies, he would be willing to forgive you. You know, I wonder, have you ever stopped to thank Jesus for his forgiveness? Have you ever taken a moment to thank Jesus for what he did for you? You could take that moment this morning and thank Jesus for dying for you. Well, then in Luke's gospel, we see one of the people there appropriate Jesus' forgiveness. One of the criminals next to Jesus begins to mock him. Are you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But then the criminal on the other side of Jesus, he rebukes him. And he turned to Jesus and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responds with his second cry on the cross saying, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It seems from the other gospel accounts that both of these criminals at first had been mocking Jesus. But maybe when this criminal heard Jesus offer forgiveness to his enemies, through the power of the Spirit, maybe he realized the true identity of Jesus. You know, true greatness is found not in retaliating, but in forgiving. True greatness is found in having the humility to let go of the offense and forgive. And maybe this is what this criminal saw when Jesus offered forgiveness to his enemies. But this criminal never would have understood this apart from a work of God's spirit. I mean, Jesus in that moment, he hardly looked like a king coming into his kingdom. He was there bloody and beaten on the cross. But the Holy Spirit worked in his heart and he saw Jesus for who he truly was, the king of kings. And he turns to him and asks him for that which he does not deserve and that which he cannot earn. And Jesus responds by saying, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, mercy and salvation is only for those who recognize like this criminal that they are helpless and that they are hopeless and they cry out to God for mercy. It is only those who realize, like this criminal, that they are helpless and hopeless and cry out for mercy. 
You see, your salvation does not rest on your works and your word, but it rests on Jesus' work and Jesus' word alone. You see, it's not just a little bit of you and a little bit of Jesus. No, it's all of Jesus and none of you. And what a privilege for this man. Just think about this man for a second. Jesus says to him, a criminal, truly today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was saving him from the penalty of sin and his suffering that very day. And what a one to save. Just imagine as Jesus goes to heaven and the angels there with him in heaven is this criminal. He's done nothing whatsoever to earn salvation. He has no track record whatsoever. whatsoever. It is all of grace. And you and I are exactly the same. This second cry on the cross should make us realize that it's not a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of you. It's all of Jesus and none of you. You need to realize that you are helpless and hopeless and cry to Jesus for mercy. You know, there were two criminals next to Jesus. Both of them were in the same boat. Both of them were suffering and dying. But one responded. One realized that he was helpless and hopeless and made a choice to turn to Jesus for mercy. I pray that you would make a choice to turn to Jesus for mercy today. The other did not. And we all have to make a choice of what we will do with Jesus. Well, that leads to the next cry, the third cry of Jesus from the cross, which is in John's gospel. John records for us that as Jesus hangs on the cross, he looks down and he sees his mother Mary. And we read in John 19 and verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, that was John, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Now this is amazing, isn't it? This is absolutely amazing. This should amaze you. Jesus' first thought as he hung, hangs on the cross is to forgive his enemies. Jesus' second thought is to offer mercy to someone who asks for it. Jesus' third, third uh, thought is to, is to offer compassion to his mother. Now, Mary, by this point, is in her late 40s. She, uh, Joseph has sort of died, and so he's moved off the scene. And so she's there, and he can see her in pain as she looks up and sees her son who is on the cross, and Jesus has compassion for her. I mean, true greatness, true godliness is being like Jesus, where in the midst of your suffering and the midst of your pain, your eyes aren't on yourself, but your eyes are on other people. Well, then we come to the fourth cry of Jesus from the cross, which is recorded in both Matthew and Mark's gospel. Matthew's gospel says that it was about the sixth hour. So it's about midday. Jesus has been on the cross from 9 a.m., to 12 o'clock, so he's been on the cross for three hours just in pain. And at midday, at 12 o'clock, it says that the whole of Israel was covered in darkness, and this darkness stayed to the ninth hour, to three o'clock. And Matthew says that it was at the ninth hour when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, this darkness that was over the whole land, it was not a solar eclipse, but this was a supernatural act of God. You see, one of the images for hell in the Bible is darkness, is being cast into darkness. God is light, and in him there is no darkness whatsoever. And I once heard someone say that right here in these three hours, we see the cross within the cross, I mean, during these three hours of darkness, this is where the atonement took place. You see, the essential part of the Christian message is that Jesus died as our substitute, that he took the death that we deserve because of our sin against God, that he was forsaken so that we could be accepted, that he took the penalty that we deserve. And so in this moment, as God is making him who knew no sin to be sin for us, Jesus is becoming the ugliest thing in the sight of the Father. As all of the sins of humanity are being laid on Jesus, God, the Holy Father, who can't look on sin, is turning his face away. Now, there is no break in the Trinity at this point. And as one writer says, as we look upon the cross, we see divine mystery. As there is this 
forsakenness between the Father and the Son. But do you realize how Jesus did this for you? Do you realize how utterly alone Jesus was at this moment? Israel had rejected him. His disciples had abandoned him. And right now, in the midst of the darkness, he is there bearing the weight of the sins of the world and his father is forsaking him. And he did this all for you. He did this for you. This fourth cry of Jesus from the cross should assure you that he loves you, that he loves you. You know, the greater the sacrifice, the more the love. If you had a bill to pay, and I, you, just say you had this massive bill to pay, and I gave you $50, you would be thankful. But if I gave you, sold my house, and gave you everything that I owned, you would really know my love. Jesus gave it all on the cross. He hung there for three hours being forsaken by the Father for you, for me. Do we doubt the love of Jesus? What great love, I ask you, can you find a greater love in all the world than that love? He was willing to be forsaken so that you might be accepted before you even knew him, before you even knew anything about him. He did this for you, for you. This fourth cry of Jesus from the cross should convince us of God's love for us. Then we read of the fifth cry of Jesus on the cross in John 19, verse 28. It says that Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill scripture, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they held it to his mouth. This cry actually shows us the humanity of Jesus. This is not some just divine sort of trick that's going on where Jesus is fully God and he's just sort of somehow appearing to suffer on the cross. Jesus was fully human and he went through all of the suffering on the cross. And as he wants to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 53 and pour out his life, he knows that he needs strength to do this. So he cries out, I thirst, and they give him a drink. And this sustains him for his sixth cry on the cross. We read this in the next verse in John 19 and verse 30. It says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. It is finished. Is there no greater words for a Christian to hear? It is finished. Jesus' work of bearing the sins of the world was complete. It was done. It was finished. You know, there is no additional sacrifice that is needed. You don't have to be a good, really good person. You don't have to make all promises to God that you're going to reform yourself. Your, the forgiveness of God comes as a free gift. Receive it. It is finished. Many Christians never experience rest in their souls. And that is because they've been deceived into thinking that there is something more that they need to do to complete their salvation. Where Jesus said 2,000 years ago, what did he say, people? It is finished. It is done. The work has been done. You can rest because he has completed his work. You know, every week I speak at church, and so I have to get a message together. And there are some Saturday nights, I hate to make this confession, but there are some Saturdays where I come and I haven't done my message for Sunday. And whenever that happens, I go to bed on Saturday night with this incompleted task hanging over my head. Now, I trick myself into thinking it'll be okay because I'll get up five in the morning and I'll be able to put something together for you at five in the morning. But whenever I do that, I can't get any rest because I have this incomplete work or this incompleted task that's hanging over my head. Maybe some of you university students or, or high school students know what I'm talking about. When you have some incompleted task that's hanging over your head, it's really hard to rest. Well, get this, Christian. It is finished. Don't be deceived. 
The work has been done. You don't have to work anymore for salvation. You can rest in the finished work of Christ. Receive those words deeply into your soul this morning. It is finished. Everything between me and God has been dealt with through the work of Christ, and all I need to do is believe it and receive it. What amazing grace. Now, the final cry of Jesus on the cross is then found in Luke 22 and verse 46, where Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and then having breathed his last, Jesus died. What beautiful final words. Jesus didn't say, I commend my body to the grave, or I commend my body to the great unknown. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus had complete confidence that his soul was going to be with God. And this is where the message comes full circle, uh, people. As I asked you at the beginning, what will your final words be? Let me tell you here this morning that you can have absolute confidence when you come to the end of your life that these final words of Jesus can be your final words. God, into your hands I commit my spirit because of if you appropriate the final words of Jesus. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. There is forgiveness available with Jesus. Jesus said, truly, Today you'll be with me in paradise. If you turn to Jesus for mercy, he will pour out salvation on you. And Jesus said, it is finished. The work is complete. But what you have to do is you have to reach out and take that free gift of salvation. You have to respond and recognize that, yes, in the eyes of God, I am helpless and I am hopeless and I need that free gift of salvation and I need to receive it from you, Lord Jesus, and believe in you, Lord Jesus. And there might be some people here today and God has been at work in your heart and you know that you need to receive that free gift of salvation and I'm gonna pray a prayer and I invite you to pray it along with me. But for many of you here this morning, you've already done that. You're already a Christian. And I hope that as we've, as we've gone over these final words of Jesus today this morning, as we've reflected on them, I hope you've seen the beauty of Jesus and your heart is being filled with gratitude. I mean, this is amazing. Jesus is suffering on the cross. His first thought is to forgive his enemies. His second thought is to pour out mercy on a criminal. His third thought is to care for his mother. What an amazing, loving savior. Is there anyone better than that? He was forsaken so that you could be accepted. And he cried out, it is finished. He completed the work of his father so we can rest in him. I pray that this Good Friday, you would, with the eyes of faith, look to your Savior and worship him. Well, let me pray. Let me pray right now. If you're here this morning and you want to receive that free gift of salvation through Jesus, as I said, why don't you pray this prayer along with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize that I am hopeless and helpless and that I need your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me on the cross. Thank you for going to the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin, and I invite you to be my Lord and Savior, and I hand my life over to you.